as you know, philosophy, um, law as a topic has always been, you know, an embarrassment to philosophy. Um, philosophers, philosophers have always, you know, starting with Plato's Ladder of Love, right? Uh, with Symposium and right down to Jean-Luc Nancy or, or even the latest work on the radicality of love. You have philosophers really struggling with the question of love. As one uh, thinker has really interest, interestingly pointed out, <clears throat> when um, philosophers try to talk about love, um, it's almost like they're struck with love, you know, the same experience, the experience of being um, dumbfounded, right, tongue-tied. That's the common response to, to uh, love, because precisely because love somehow uh, resides beyond thought, right? What, uh, you know, philosophers like, especially, I think, I don't, I don't find a lot of philosophers, I think, uh, um, Philosophers like Alain Badiou, Luc Ferry, Jean-Luc Nancy, these people have tried to actually bring love within the domain of thought. You know, to talk about um, uh, love in a manner that really, um, you know, um, brings it within and main, I mean, uh, keeps it within the domain of thought. Um, I would like to begin here. Can I, can I show my uh, you know, PowerPoint? Uh, can I open that here now? Yes, can sir. I, just I, just a second. Hold on a second, sir. Uh, can we promote him to host, Jisha? Yeah, I think I can do that, right? It's really funny, you know, the way you promote people. <laughs> uh, can I share now? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Um, can you see my screen now? Yes, sir, we can. Okay. Um, okay. So um, what I want to do is to share with you uh, some thoughts. This is the last talk, right, in the conference. So I thought I would really discuss with you. I've been um, listening to the talks here and even though uh, Professor Sundar Sarukai spoke about the philosophy of love, uh, I think I would be speaking about uh, the same philosophy, but restricted to one particular philosopher. Let's see what he's got to tell us and how he works it out, right? I mean, um, um, for Badio, there are actually four conditions for philosophy, and one of which is love. For Badio, <clears throat> these are the four regimes, you know, science, love, art, and politics. Badio is a very, very, um, you know, um, innovative, creative notion of love. For him, these four dimensions, science, love, art, and politics, are the dimensions in which human beings produce their own truths. These four conditions, he calls them truth procedures. In one sense, what Alain Badiou does is to relate philosophy to its age-old primordial function of discovering truth. But there is a huge difference. It's not in the same way as Plato does it, or Descartes does it, for whom the truth is I think therefore I am, you know, um, if you could summarize the entire philosophy of Descartes in one sentence, that would be that. You can do that for uh, several philosophers. Actually, Alain Badiou said that the success of a great philosopher is the ability to produce the entire philosophy in a single sentence. And we'll look at his sentence later. So truth is not something for, for Badiou that is already there. Because he, he says that, first of all, people produce truths in four regimes of life, four ways of life. One is science, love, art, and politics. These are the four regimes. And the philosophy operates on the basis of multiple truths. So with, with Mahathir, we find right at the beginning a deconstruction of a critique of the notion that there is one truth. Even when you look at the entire world, the entire reality. 
There is no single truth. The whole of humanity actually can be summarized in these four terms, science, love, art, and politics. Not necessarily in that order because he gives us different orders in different places. And philosophy doesn't generate those truths. That's the most important part. Philosophy does <clears throat> operate on the basis of multiple truths. Philosophy doesn't really generate them. These four regimes generate them. So truth is not in the traditional sense of accumulated knowledge or wisdom. One must come to conceive of truth as making a whole in knowledge. So there is no, there's no truth which is already there, which you can use. Because the real truth is actually something that arrives by making a whole in knowledge. What you really think is true, I mean, your truth has not been produced. You produce your truth. Human beings produce their truth. See, how do they produce their truth? The conditions that he talks about, any conditioning of a great philosophy, according to him, at the furthest reaches of instituted and consolidated knowledge. We already have <clears throat> what is called centuries of philosophy. We could be, we could call them consolidated and instituted knowledge. But we do not find truth within instituted and consolidated knowledge. For Badio, instituted and consolidated knowledge is actually fact, it's not truth. It was at one point, as, I mean, truth invented or produced by humans. But when you try to produce truth, when you talk about philosophy, when you try to produce truth in any of the four regimes we spoke about, science, art, politics, love, uh, Bedio argues that it must happen at the furthest limit of knowledge, existing knowledge, which means you're making a hole in knowledge. And how does this happen? It happens through crises, breakthroughs, and paradoxes of mathematics and science. Of course, when you talk about um, what a scientist do, what does a scientist do? Then I mean, in other words, a scientist can make a hole in knowledge. It's very clear how it is done, right? Copernicus makes a hole in Ptolemaic cosmology. And Ptolemaic cosmology is completely rewritten. The quaking of poetic language. Every poem, as Frederick Turner was saying in the early in the morning session, right? Poetry, he said, is is fast evolution and evolution is slow poetry. It's a quaking, it is not the, I mean, when you talk about poetry, you can't use the word expression really because in art, in poetry and in painting, these are two creative, two areas, right? Where people really make their truths, produce their truths through the quaking of language, through the quivering of language. Then the revolutions and provocations of inventive politics then the revolutionary politics. And finally, the wavering of the relation between the two sexes, love. In other words, what Elaine Badiou does here is giving us a summary of exactly how human beings become human. See, if this is one sentence that appears in, in his second work, you know, uh, Badiou has published three books, a trilogy. Uh, the, last, the latest work appeared, I think last year, the first was being an event. The second was logics of worlds. And he himself has said that they're very complex. He called them nuclear warhead, warheads, you know, very difficult to understand. In logics of worlds, he actually gives us a one sentence summary of his philosophy, which is there are bodies and languages, except that there are truths. This is the difference between all other existing continental philosophy and Alain Badiou's position as a philosopher. Most philosophies speak about bodies and languages. We have bodies, objects, things, you know, people, etc., outside. And then we have languages to express them. These two are, are the, you know, fundamental, what we call fundamental ontology. 
you know, what we actually call the most important crucial dimension of philosophical, you know, investigation, bodies and languages. And we can see that if you look at continental philosophy, you see that, you know, most of them actually dealt with this. You know, you have phenomenologists, you have deconstructionists who speak about languages. I mean, you can see Western philosophy or, or continental philosophy actually playing or focusing on one or the other or both. But all these philosophies actually miss one thing. That is where, Fro I mean, Badio comes in. Truths. It's okay that there are bodies and languages. I mean, he, he, he praises Derrida, he praises um, Foucault, right? To take two examples of this, right? Foucault was, as you know, deeply concerned with bodies, docile bodies, so how, how, to, how to, you know, um, discipline bodies and so on and so forth. Derrida was literally, Derrida's entire philosophy could be seen as a, as a meditation on language, which, which Badiou seriously objects to. Philosophy should not be a meditation on its medium for him. All these people actually discredited both Foucault, both any philosophers in that particular lineage, you know, uh, Foucault, um, you, you take any one of them, Wittgenstein, who thought that there's no reality, there are only uses, there are only games, language games, you know. So um, Badio actually literally classifies all philosophers, especially of the 20th century. And right, right from the beginning, you know, in fact, not 20th century. As philosophers who either focus on the bodies, you have Merleau-Ponty speaking about the body, you have Descartes speaking about, you know, the bodies and the mind, body, mind and body, you know, calling room. You have uh, a number of others speaking about languages, you know, but nobody spoke about truths. <clears throat> this is where, you know, love becomes an ideal form through which for, for, for uh, at least for um, Badiou, love is a production of truth. Remember that, this is very important. Every instituted, consolidated knowledge for Badiou is fact, because they've been accepted as fact. Whereas every contested truth, I mean, everything that you contest, that you experience for the first time is truth. So philosophy must deal with not only bodies and languages, not only objects, things, and you know, other aspects of the world, because bodies, if you take a human body, we know that a human body exceeds the body. We know that a human, I mean, a poet exceeds the language that he speaks. So uh, there are truths too. How do we look at truths? I call, he, call it, he calls it a truth procedure. <clears throat> For him, it is this truth, through this truth procedure that a subject emerges. I call a truth procedure or a truth an ongoing organization. So truth for Badio is not an already instituted category of knowledge. It's an ongoing organization. This is actually beautiful because a person in love experiences love as an ongoing phenomenon of life. Because as, as we would know a little later, Badia would say that, you know, no one who is in love actually knows what love is. That's the difference between love and the other three versions. We'll, we'll talk about it. So there is this truth procedure or truth on ongoing organization in a given situation of the consequences of an event. So there are three important con philosophical concepts here. One is organization, the other, I mean, sorry, truth procedure or truth. The other is situation and then the consequences of an event. For, for, for Badio, human beings actually produce their truths in situations. A situation into which a human being finds himself or herself. Imagine the moment of love that, you know, a man or a woman you know, at a certain moment in his or her life, we never know. Because this can happen at first sight, as they call it. You know, love at first sight. It can also happen after a long friendship. Actually, Badio talks about both. But whenever it happens, it's a random happening at that particular point. 
you cannot rule out a kind of fundamental randomness about love. You know, people wonder why they were friends and suddenly they're lovers. Right? It happens at a point of time. That is why Badio, Badio calls, calls it an event. So a person, two friends, you know, they're friends, a man and a woman, they're really friends. They're friends, they live like friends for, let's say, months and months. So that was an event of friendship. An event is something that happens unexpectedly. There is, you know, in philosophy, we make a distinction between an event and an incident. An incident is what we talk about incidents in history that we already know about. But an event is a very lauded word. It's not something that you can talk, I mean, something, it's unexpected, right? But, I mean, it's an event. The fact that I'm, I'm rather unwell today is, is an event. I, when I gave my date for this talk, I never knew, I had no idea that I was going to be unwell today. It's an event. And now every event, it could be sickness, it could be love, it could be, you know, a piece of scientific knowledge, it could be a poem. Every event has a kind of fundamental randomness about it. And it is in this randomness that truth is produced. How? Through a fidelity to that event. This is the term, you know, um, Badio uses. Right? As far as Badio is concerned, the notion of a subject is a very rare notion because the contemporary concepts of the subject of subjectivity are inadequate because contemporary philosophy, contemporary thinking on, on, on subject looks at it as a constituted whole, as someone who's already ex who already exists. But for Badio, the constituted whole or unity of a human being is an individual. And an individual actually is not the same as the subject. The subject is rare because contrary to contemporary opinion, subject cannot simply coincide with individual. They're both too different. Because for, for Badio, the subject is formed only in that particular moment, in that uncanny eventual moment, when that particular subject shows fidelity to a truth, the truth of an event. So at some point you believe that this, this, the truth of this event was friendship. Friendship is an event. You meet a friend forever, that's an event. And you remain loyal. You show fidelity to that truth. And by producing that truth, you become a subject of truth. And you, you, but years later or probably months later, at some random moment, when you're together with your friend, you realize that this is actually not friendship. It's a little beyond that. That's another event. So truth always is, is subjective and it has an eventual origin. So it says a fundamental randomness is part of every truth. This, this shows that truth for Badio is something that, is, that, that happens later, much later. I mean, it's not something that is already there. I mean, to use Zizek, Zizek, uh, I'm sure you know that Badiou and Zizek share an amazing, you know, friendship um, that borders on almost love. You know, they, they love uh, their company. They do a lot. They've done a lot of work. I think his work event um, published in 2014 is deeply, he's deeply indebted to uh, Badiou's thinking in that. So, even the term has to be explained. It's not the usual even, right? The event is a word, as you know, which has its most uh, prosaic and, you know, ordinary pedestrian use. Like we say, um, for example, this conference is an event, right? There's nothing eventual about this conference, by the way. This is, we use it as a kind of, an, kind of a ceremony as a, in that sense. But that meaning does stay. Look at how Zizekin is typically, you know, um, uh, blasphemous and uh, mischievous way says that event is an amphibious notion with even more than 50 shades of gray. I'm sure you will make the connections. And each connection would be an event. An event can refer to a devastating natural disaster. It ought to the latest celebrity scandal, 
the event, the triumph for the people or a brutal political change or an intense experience of a work of art or an intimate decision, right? Indirectly, Zizek looks at the four conditions of philosophy, which Badio, I mean, you know, talks about science, politics, and love. A scandal or a disaster or a, or a breakthrough, we probably could add a scientific breakthrough. It is also an event. A political change, revolution is an event. An intense artistic experience is an event. And it can transform us. And finally, an intimate personal decision about love is also an event. So even must be understood in a Baduian sense in this way. This is how Badio defines truth, I mean humanity. Humanity is the historical body of truths. So every human being produces his own truth in these four possible domains. History, I mean, uh, science, politics, art, and love. By humanity, I mean that which provides support to the truth procedures. So there is, each one is a truth procedure. We produce knowledge. And there are four types of such procedures, science, politics, art, and love. And the most important point is this, humanity can be attested if and only if there is emancipatory, liberatory politics, conceptual science, creative art, and love. And again, what kind of love? Not reduced to a mix of sentimentality and sexuality. We'll, we'll talk about that. To be human is to be political in the broadest sense of the term. To be political is not to be a politician. To be political is to question reality as it exists and produce truths that will affect a collective. You know, we will look at that again. Conceptual science. Science is again, you know, building of con concepts, creative art and love. So humanity is a historical body of truths. He's not interested in, you know, uh, if you, if you glorify, let's say, Alexander the Great, what Alexander the Great has done is produce a body of truths, his own truths. History is basically that. Remember, the moment you talk about truths, you're talking about being creative. What history gives us is actually a record of truths in these four uh, regimes or, or domains, science, politics, art, and love. There's nothing else for value, nothing beyond this. This is all there is. So if you want to attest the existence of humanity, you need to look at this, right? So this is where we see the humanity. This is how, you know, Badio uses H, X function for that. H is the technical term used. He has a, you know, he's a mathematician as well. He's a mathematical scholar and his philosophical writings are, you know, um, deeply, I would say fractured by uh, too much use of, use of mathematics. Now, <clears throat> let's look at how he defines each one of this quickly and uh, move on to, you know, uh, love. Science is no concern for the subjective infinity of situations. This is how science works. It doesn't care about subjects or subjective or psychology of a situation. Subjective, every situation for value is infinite. And remember, uh, situation is defined by Badio as a presented multiplicity. For example, in this morning when I woke up, I was very tired. This was a new situation for me. I was hoping to conserve all my energy so that I can make a rather useful presentation, which required, as I said, high energy. But this was a situation. And remember, situation is infinite. It provides an infinity of opportunities, you know, decisions that we can take. Because it is in, this, in these decisions that the subject is formed. But the difference between science and other domains, the three other domains, is that science doesn't care about the subjective infinitive situations. It works for the objective infinitive situations. Whereas we, uh, when we come to art, art gives us, the, presents the sensible in the finitude of the work. 
What we have is a poem, which is a finite work, which is a limited uh, you know, work. And we, what we get from art is a sensation. It's not, as most people believe, meaning. Art, I mean, poetry and art, any artwork for that matter. They give us affective intensities. They present the sensible in the finitude of the work. So every work, every po poem, every, every poem, every uh, uh, painting is actually limited in that a work of art is limited. And within that finitude, within that limited sense of a work, art gives us sensations. Science gives us concepts, conceptual understanding of the situation. Art gives us affective intensities of a situation. And politics summons the infinity of the situation. Any, any politics proper, right? You see an injustice, you see someone doing something wrong, or you see something, some, uh, the state committing some mistake. What you do if you want to be political, if, you, if you're not political, you understand that as a finite event and you forget about it. But if you want to be political, it forbade you, you summon the infinity of the situation because you're going to make changes in the society, in your reality that will remain infinite. Every politics of emancipation and liberation rejects finitude. It's very easy. We'll talk about a little about Marxism later. Marxism is a kind of emancipatory politics. We know that. But its vision is um, not finitude. It's, it's infinite. It's infinity. It, it dreams of a paradise. Let's not forget, let's not worry about the practical application of Marxism or, you know, what, what we are saying is politics literally brings to life the infinity of a situation. In other words, it extends its potential. And, you know, it tries to see within any given situation what a collective, a group of people is capable of doing. If you feel that you're, you're violated, if your privacy is invaded, and if you think that you need to attack, I mean, if you take a simple example, so, you know, think about, for instance, the kiss of love, even the kiss of love, and since it is related to love, I'm taking that. At one particular point, a person begins to summon the infinity of the situation. If that person thinks only about, you know, one, a group of people, you know, doing some kind of moral policing and, you know, attacking someone for, for you know, doing whatever they did, you know, you're, you're looking at it from a finite point of view, from an individual perspective, but you're not doing that. If you're political, what you do is, you summon the infinity of the situation and then you reject finity. So politics can be defined in that sense. And love is the interminable fidelity to a first naming. This is bad use. So many definitions, one of so many definitions. What happens in love is this for bad use. There is a situation of love situation where you feel something for your for the other person and at that point you're not you're confused you don't know what this is but there is a point at which you decide to say to that person i love you or i'm in love with you and that will be marked by a kind of fidelity which is interminable at least at the point that you make that you commit yourself at that point your fidelity that's a that's a first naming, right? This is always a problem, especially in Western societies. What do you say to this? And what am I feeling for this person? Is it mere attraction? Is it sexual attraction? Is it, or do, do I want to be committed? Is it love? Do I want to, can I stand this person for the rest of my life? And so many other questions. But you need to name it. And not only name it, but remain loyal, show fidelity. You know, fidelity, fiduciary, it means trust. You know, it means loyalty. And love is the interminable fidelity to a first name. And I mean, it's, it's an event. I'm not saying that there's interminable fidelity 
is everlasting. That's not what I'm saying. Loss of love, falling out of love, can also be an event. It can, it can be an event too. It is an event too because you produce another truth. So the moment you love, the moment you name this particular fidelity, you fracture the one. You're no, you, you no more, you're not actually, I mean, true fracture is the one. You're not one anymore in one sense. You don't become two, okay? By the way, is against that kind of fusional perspective. We'll talk about it. It doesn't believe in the fusional conception of love. Two fractures the one and meets with the infinity of the situation. Suddenly, that particular moment of love becomes an infinite moment. I'm sure those who have experienced love would feel, I mean, would understand what I'm saying. But Badio says that in the case of, in the case of, you know, politics, we need more than one people. We need a collective. We need so many people to attest to the value of that politics. But science, art, and love are aristocratic truth procedures. Why are they aristocratic? Because in the case of love, you need only one scientist and probably another equally powerful scientist to say that this is great breakthrough. And that is a new piece of knowledge. That is truth. In art, you don't need anybody. You just write, you just paint and paint, paint a picture or write a poem and just leave it. Whether others like it or not, you've produced it. You don't care about the other people. You are an aristocrat. In that sense, you're aristocratic. You don't have to worry about it. Love, of course, requires two. That's why that you call it the scene, two scene, right? So these are all truth procedures. We all produce these kinds of truths. But the difference between love and the other three, four domains is this. You know, it's very funny that um, Badiou says, no theme requires more pure logic than that of love. Remember, he says pure logic, not applied logic, pure logic. And love is anything but logic as far as we know. In another essay, in his book called Infinite Thought, he talked, he invokes Rambo's, uh, you know, Rambo's famous logical revolt, you know, the concept of logical revolt a kind of revolt that falls within the realm, the domain of logic. We could use that for love as well. That's what Matthew means when he says that, uh, you know, love is logical. But love is unique when you compare these, compare love to the other three domains of art, science, and politics. Love is unique. You know why love is unique? This is why love is unique. The experience of the loving object does not constitute any knowledge of love. The thought that constitutes love is not the thought of itself. It's an amazing, you know, definition of love, if you look at it. The experience of the scientist is actually, is what constitutes the knowledge of science. The experience of the politics, of the politician, of the politics, the political person, is the knowledge of that particular situation. The experience of the painter is the knowledge of the painting or of the poem. The experience of the, 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 the scientific subject, the political subject, the poetic or the artistic subject, their experience constitutes their knowledge of that particular subject. But the experience of the loving subject does not constitute any, no, constitute any knowledge of love. The thought that constitutes love is not the thought of itself. This is a contradiction actually, but it's a beautiful contradiction. Nobody who loves knows anything about love. There's no knowledge. Love, the production of love is truth. Love is not the result of, a, nor is, of any kind of knowledge. That's not at all. That is why, you know, you have Zamyatin in 1921, this Russian writer in a novel wrote this amazing sentence. The effect of that woman on me was, and I was as unpleasant as a displaced irrational number that is accidentally crept into an equ equation. That's why you have, you know, here, uh, Jean-Luc Nancy, in his famous article, you know, The Shattered Love, um, I haven't read the article because I don't think it's available in, 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 in English yet, um, uh, but I have read about it. I understand uh, this is a quote from that uh, particular article. The impossibility of speaking about love has been violently recognized. That's part of its logic. So you can see this here. 
uh, look at the look at the four words there: the unpleasant, displacement, irrationality, accident. These are things that we use often associate with uh, love, right? It's unpleasant. It is beautiful, sublime, but somehow it creates a sense of unpleasant because it it literally dislocates everything, right? So and it's irrational. It invo involves displacement. You you in the Western terms, you want to move in with the person. In other terms, you know, you want to move away, your life is totally changed. So love is a unique condition in that love, being a loving subject, requires absolutely no knowledge of no, no, I mean love. This is why love is probably the most eventual truth of all. You never constitute, you can never have that knowledge, right? Now, he talks about, I think, if, um, yeah, I will try to conclude as quickly as possible. Um, a few more slides, I think. So <clears throat> Abadio actually attacks these three kinds of love. He doesn't think highly of this. One is the fusional conception of love, according to which love, this is Badio, love is not that which from a two taken as structurally given creates one of ecstasy. So usually when we talk about love romantically, we talk about fusion. And he says that that's, that doesn't make any sense at all. There is no fusion of ecstasy. That's that's almost imaginary. That doesn't you know mean anything. Then there is the the the, the oblative you know conception of love, according to which love does not involve prostrating the same before the altar of the other. In other words, this is another common experience of love. I love her because she is in so many ways just like me, right? And Badia would say that that also doesn't explain love. Love is not proper love if you like a person because a person is same in so many ways. It is not prostrating the same before the altar of the other. That's, that's, that's not what, what true love is. True love is the production of truth, individual production of truth. And through that production of truth, a subject is formed. That's why we could even argue that the bad you in, you know, subject is in one sense post-truth because he produces that truth, and in the production of the truth, a loving subject emerges, a knowledgeable subject emerges when you come up with a piece of new knowledge, right? So he also looks at the illusory conception of love, you know, the Lacanian kind of love. Love does not compensate for anything according to Badi. Love doesn't compensate, you know, the famous statement from, from Lacan and the others. Lacan said, love is giving what you don't have, right? In other words, love is, you know, a kind of a lack. Lacan believed that there is no, the famous sentence from Lacan is, there's no sexual relationship. What he meant is that a relationship between the two is not possible, even Badiou. Even Badiou believes that this junction is the most important aspect of love. I mean, the man and the woman will always remain separate. They're disjunct. They're two positions, not one. Each experience is love in, in his own or their own way. Love cannot compensate for anything. If you think that you love that lover because she has something that is not in you, that is wrong. That is not proper love. That is an illusion. That you think that there is a fantasy lack in you and you think that that fantasmatic lack can be compensated through love. That doesn't happen. Love is a production of truth. And the reason you love is because at that particular moment of the event, you think that is the truth of your life. He calls it to see in love. And he says that the biggest problem in to, to society today is that people do not fall in love anymore. The reason is that, you know, um, you know, he, this is a love confronts two enemies, essentially one safety guaranteed by an insurance policy, right? See, so this is what, this is the, this is the meaning of what he's called. Not only, and he's not talking about arranged marriage, okay? You know that, there is no arranged marriage in, in, in the West now. You know, it's, a, it's an old system, right? I mean, Luc Ferry talks about it at length. For Luc Ferry, the greatest revolution of, of the 21st century or, or the current century is that we, we move from a marriage of convenience to a marriage of love. I mean, it's quite debatable whether we have done that, we have made that shift or move yet. But still, to a great extent, even though our marriages are arranged, I think there is an element of love in it. I can say, I mean, we can say that there are people 
living in the old system, right? People always do that. People even today, there are people living in the 21st century and people living in the first century. It can always happen. But generally we see that there is a movement. That's an amazing movement. In Praise of Lao, actually Badiou talks about this because he was amazed by this, this dating agencies. What dating agencies do in the West, as you know, Tinder and all that, is to look at the similarities and they tell you this is what you want. What they're trying to do is to calculate every moment of your life, every aspect of a person's character so that safety is guaranteed. For Badiou, the greatest threat to love is safety. This feeling of safety, this refusal to take risk. And for him, risk defines all the four domains. In order to have knowledge in science, if you want to be a true scientist, you need to be willing to risk and create a hole in knowledge, in the existing knowledge. If you want to fall in true love, you need to create that hole. You know, you need to dig a hole in the existing system because that is how you produce your. So love, you know, uh, without fall is, you know, the, it's, it's a tragic situation because what you get is a comfort zone. In the West, what they have is sex without love. That's what, regulated pleasures. You buy them, you get them. They call it one night stand. They call it all by all other names. But you know what? what is happening to them. This is why I think Badio, as a psychoanalyst, he's also a psychoanalyst, you know, as a canyon psychoanalyst. He believes that the reason why, you know, the biggest problem with people in the West is that youngsters are, are, are suffering from a lot of sexual problems like erectile, I mean, you know, dysfunction and so on at the age of 20, 22. Badio speaks about it in detail in his amazing book called The True Life where he says that because these people are open, everything, you know, everything is open to them. You know, in the past, we were, we were not free to do whatever we wanted. The father in the house had all, had monopolized all the juzans, the pleasures, you know, everything was up to the father. Now it's the children in the West. They have complete control of the juzans, the, the pleasures you know, of life. What they don't have is love. Everyone is using dating agencies and so on. So the safety guarantee, because love, what exactly is love? Love, the experience of love is this. It's not regulated pleasure. It's this. What kind of world does one see when one experiences it from the point of view of two and not one? This is the question a lover, a lover, you know, uh, poses himself or herself. What kind of world does one see when one experiences it from the point of view of two, and not one? What is a world like when it is experienced, developed and lived from the point of view of difference and not identity? Can we look at, you know, we always try to fusional concept of love and the oblative concept of love. These conceptions actually want us to look at life from a point of identity. I like her because she's similar to me. We are all, it's like we are one identity. That's not the point of love. To look at the world from a view of difference. In other words, for that to happen, you need to fall. You need to fall in love. Fall, remember, it's very easy to understand, right? Fall is, is amazingly random. There is a fundamental randomness about fall, right? Like, uh, like in one of those movies where Kochinanifa says, I don't know how to fall in slow motion. You can't fall in slow motion because you don't, you don't you know, um, orchestrate a fall. Because if you orchestrate a fall, it's not a fall. Love is orchestrated, planned in a certain way, and therefore it's not love. Actually, Zizek takes this notion of love without fall, um, you know, across the cultural domain. And he talks about uh, this particular aspect and how this has spread to, to all various other parts of the society. He says, he talks about, you know, um, you know uh, uh, coffee without caffeine right? Sugar without sugar, right? You know that. The first beer I had, I mean, probably that is the only beer I had, was from, nobody would believe, it was from Saudi Arabia, Mecca. You know? That was a beer without alcohol. It was available in plenty. I don't, I don't know why they drink it, but it's called, it is, it is okay, beer without alcohol. 
love without fall. Zizek actually discusses this and you know, makes it part of, this is actually a trend, a contemporary way of looking at the world, trying to calculate life to such an extent, right? The reason why parents spend so much time on getting their kids full applauses is this, scared of the fall, the random moment where truth is produced by the individual. No student, no one is producing the truth, right? So, <clears throat> I will always love you, says Matthew, is in effect locking chance into the framework of eternity. This is what happens in life. You know, a moment of love, if you take it in the case of love at first sight, right, or any love for that matter, is a random moment. It's a chance moment. Nothing is chancier than that. And nothing is, by the way, chancier or riskier than love. But then what you do is, this chance moment is locked into the framework of eternity. The problem then resides in inscribing the, this eternity within time. It's a beautiful paradox, if you think about it. Seeing eternity in an instant. Where, where love becomes a political category. The problem then resides in inscribing this eternity within time. Basically, love is a declaration of eternity to be filled, fulfilled as best it can be within time. Eternity descending into time. That's why it is such an intense feeling. Exactly what happens to a revolutionary. A revolutionary commitment is nothing but eternity descending into time. You experience love as something eternal, while you know that you're rooted to time. He says that when you have that experience of eternity in an instant, it's an intense feeling. And, you know, it's, um, it's, a, it's an amazingly intense feeling. And that is why probably he calls it, you know, a minimal communism. Why is minimal communism, right? Because communism, as you know, is actually a, a, a vision for the future of a collective. Communism tries to see what, you know, he uses the word communism all the time because basically uh, Badiou doesn't believe that there is something called Marxism. He thinks that Marxism as such doesn't exist because it has been, what we call Marxism today has been reframed by Althusser, by Frederick James, by so many, by Gramsci, by so many people. So what we have today is not Marxism, but communism. Why is it minimal? Because it's a communism of two people. Communism has a vision of equality between two people, as a vision of common, as a common vision, a common perspective. Love is subject to the law of repetition. Revolution or politics is also subject to the law of repetition. Politics never comes to an end. Every new situation, you know, a political revolution may lead to a new system. But the new system will produce new problems. So politics never comes to an end. Politics repeats itself. Repeats itself because politics is subject to the law of repetition. Love, I don't have to say, is also subject to the law of repetition. That is why the lovers keep saying, I love you, I love you. And the lovers keep asking the so-called Lacanian historical question, right? Do you love me? That's why uh, Lacan calls a lover a sublime historic, because that's a historical question, because that doesn't have an answer. Remember that love is subject to the law of repetition, which means that it has to begin every day again. And if you don't, if you forget to say this, I love you, right? Then love is in crisis. Revolution works in the same way. Love is a minimal, minimal communism in that sense. Love is not necessarily any more peaceful than revolutionary politics. People die, right? Suicides and murders and deaths are prompted by love. You know that. We have a whole history of artworks, you know, poems, poetry, literature, and so on, right? Love is, has always been connected with death. It's not peaceful. It's not peaceful. The word communism encompasses the idea that the collectivity is capable of integrating all extra political differences. Look at the way love becomes a political category here. Nothing in the world can actually integrate extra political differences. You know what extra political differences are. 
your cultural background, your religious background, your caste background, all these extra political you know, differences are automatically forgotten in true love. Communism works in the same way, at least theoretically, right? There is no caste in communism. There is no casteism, there is no religion, right? Of course, communists don't really, you know, the true so-called true communists, you know, they, they're not into, not talking about the new, new, you know, versions of it, right? But um, um, love, you fall in love with someone in that particular moment, that moment, that eventual moment, you produce a truth, you establish, you declare a kind of fidelity to the truth. And the moment of the declaration coincides with the dissolution of all poli extra political differences, family background, nothing matters. In other words, there is a steep fall. If you want to use the, the, the falling in love, right? Jean-Luc Nancy has an amazing book called The Fall of Sleep, where he talks about how people fall asleep. It's probably the most fundamental random event in our life, falling asleep. You can try to be asleep. I mean, you can try to sleep, but the moment of the fall is unpredictable. So this particular moment of the fall, the love fall, is when in a single stroke, all extra political differences, culture, language, literature, family background, your passports, nothing matters. All linguistic, cultural, and socio-political, all these differences are integrated immediately. Right? Well, that is why communism, when you feel it, communism is a collective experience of potential universality. Any politics is a potential experience of universality. Love is an individual experience of this universal feeling. It's a material procedure that reevaluates the totality of experience. Probably that's the most beautiful. Um, Sorry, Rina, can I take five more minutes or should I conclude? Yeah. You can, you can. Yes, sir, you can. Yeah. Love is an individual experience of potential universality. It's a material procedure that reevaluates the totality of experience, right? When you fall in love, you know, the kind of things that lovers say, they're very interesting. They would say that I have waited for this moment, right? You're an ordinary citizen, an individual who has a wonderful life, you know, occasional, occasional experiences of love. Probably you visit a brothel or you visit clubs, nightclubs. You, you have a good job. You hang out with people. You have a family. You visit your parents. You're, 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 you have a very normal life until that day, that moment, when you come across this particular person. And that moment tells you that you have to reevaluate and retotalize the entirety of your experience. You suddenly tell yourself, oh my God, this is what I have been born for. I was born for. This is what, this is how, this is exactly what communism does, right? Communism says that, you know, you belong to a class, right? Class consciousness is the first moment of the revolutionary struggle. The moment you become conscious of the class you belong to, the moment you become aware of the fact that the society has to be total, I mean, you know, you, the moment you actually entertain the notion of totality, which is an important notion in communism, in Marxism, right? That is the moment when you realize that you're part of a whole. And in this part of a whole, unfortunately, there is the, 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 the bad, the, the rich and the poor. And this has to stop. You reevaluate, you imagine, you envision a society, you envision a classless society where all kinds of extra political differences disintegrate and you integrate them into one single life. That's a moment when you see yourself as part of a whole. As long as you don't see yourself as part of a whole, you are exploited, you are a worker. But the moment you know that you're exploited, that you're oppressed, you're part of an oppressive system and the system doesn't have to be oppressive. You experience potential universality. You know, that is, yeah, I think I'm on to my final slide. So um, whenever Bahadio talks about 
philosophy always talks about facts as opposed to truths. He makes a distinction between the state. You know, he says that the state as such, the government, you know, it facts are the result of governments, right? What the governments have are facts. What human beings do are going beyond those facts and producing truths. The state is therefore almost always about the betrayal of political hall. And Badia would say that family is the state of love. Which is in one sense saying that family always betrays the possibility of love. Not exactly, but there is a point that he's trying to make here. The institution called the state works with facts that are already made constituted, instituted facts, established knowledge. And human beings, according to Badiou, become subjects only when they produce their own truths in every given situation. And how do they do this? They do this by expressing solidarity or uh, showing fidelity to the truth of an event. Event is unpredictable. Every event is unpredictable. And an individual who shows fidelity to that unpredictability, to that unpredictable event, is producing not only truth, but his own subjectivity in that truth. When a girl, when a married woman, you know, quarrels with her husband, what is she doing? She is actually showing some kind of fidelity to an eventual rupture or eruption. That's what it is. To make a declaration of love is to move from the event encounter to embark on a construction of truth. That is how chance is curved. The absolute contingency of the encounter with someone I didn't know finally takes on the appearance of destiny. You know, Nietzsche uses the term, I think, amor fati, meaning love of fate. This is the most difficult part and the most beautiful part in one sense. To make a declaration of love is to move from the event encounter of love to embark on a construction of truth. So when you fall in love, according to Badiou, you're constructing a truth with another person. And in that possible construction of truth, remember that your truth is not the same as the other person's truth. That person is constructing his or her own truth. And this particular construction begins with the declaration, I love you. I want you, I love you, I want to be with you. And with that particular statement, you announce your fidelity to the truth of the event. And in that announcement, the absolute contingency, chance of the encounter is controlled, is frozen. And what happens is the contingent becomes the necessary. Contingency gives way to necessity. This is the event becomes destiny. Amor fati is the idea that you need to love fate. This is why, you know, George Simmel calls faithfulness or fidelity inertia of the soul. In one sense, this is what they call it, you know. If you want to talk about eternal love, you have to, say, George Simmel, establish a kind of iner inertia of the soul. Your soul was actually very active when you fell in love in order to maintain that love forever as part of your destiny, as a permanent construction, you must make sure that your soul doesn't get excited again. So faithfulness for George Simmel is inertia of the soul. The event of love is a construction. I think with this, we can conclude. There are questions I'd love to take them. And thank you very much. Oh, I've taken more than I was supposed to. Over to you, Rina. Hello. <clears throat> Am I audible? Yes, sir. Yes, sir, you're audible. Thank you, Dr. Kunyamad, for that uh, 
wonderful one hour uh, elaboration on a topic which is uh, baffled which is uh, should the whole of humanity uh, so in good stead for so many centuries for, for so many eons together uh, is not simply through literature but even to cave the understand the different uh, the different what you say manifestations and ramifications of love so beautifully present i was just wondering what uh, dr kunyamad would be doing would he uh, just was a sort of what you say verbios uh, verbage on love which is such a wonderful experience and i'm sure mm-hmm. i still remember when i was working at sn college kannur the malayalam department the department of malayalam used to host frequent seminars and uh, debates on the topic of love and uh, the first uh, person whom they usually uh, seek to talk about love is myself because everybody falls in love as kunyamad uh, dr kunyamad was saying fall this fall is experienced by everybody but since it is a fall nobody wants to uh say how that fall has experienced him or how what kind of experience that fall has given to him or her uh i still remember uh when we talk about love when we were in college as students we often quote karl marx karl marx uh had a long love relationship with jenny marx whom he married and when he began talking about the organic relationship between man and woman and love who who were falling in love he just made the statement he begins the statement uh, in in a letter to jenny marx uh, dear jenny i am not going to talk about feuerbach thesis in this letter i am going to talk about man woman relationship because a man loves a woman or a woman loves a man and what happens is that when you love a woman you grow through a woman or when a woman loves a man she grows through a man and that is what has been uh, described theoretically or uh, perceptively put in the form of a bad use theory as uh, the break up of uh, the experience of uh, the reality of love into infinity uh in so many ways uh, very poetically it has been theoretic it has been poetically theoretic that is how i would comment uh, on dr kunyamath's presentation uh with uh, the perspective uh, uh, lay, uh laid forth by alan badju because when he talks about the the presence of infinity in the presence of eternity in time uh, it is poetry it is poetry because we cannot uh, talk about love the way we talk about the um uh, mathematical equations or the equations in science uh, and somebody was posting a message in the course of the presentation i think it was mr abu he is reminded of uh, uh vaikam mohammad bashir's uh, uh, story which was made into a wonderful movie madhuligal by adur govarakrishnan Uh, i think uh, i may not be able to enjoy the session i am sure all the wonderful listeners esteemed listeners faculty members researchers students must definitely have had the experience of love or they might even now be having the experience of love share your experience theoretically because theory is a very very good mask also you needn't be afraid of anyone yeah nyamada has given a wonderful mask just like the face mask which will keep you insulated from uh, what you say the uh, virus of morality or the virus of uh, what you call a prudery let us not be uh, prudish on this occasion you uh, kunyamad uh, sir will be ready to give answers to any kind of uh, questions you, you ask uh excuse me for some time because i have to i'm doing examination duty in between definitely i'll be listening to the question answer session also but uh, the floor is open i request uh, uh madam to please uh, enthuse the students and other researchers and participants and faculty members to ask a few exciting interesting questions to dr kunyamath thank you 
over to uh, the question answer session. The, the floor is open for uh, the question answer session. Thank you. Dr. Rida, can you uh, please? Uh, um, oh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Thank yeah. you, sir. Uh, so there's a question. Yes, sir. There is a question uh, by Pinky Isha. And it, it is like this. Uh, can Dr. KK Punyamad explain if love is a very loaded word, something that demands fidelity? On the other hand, we can have words like attachment, connection, e equally powerful words. Like uh, what's Professor's take on that? Yeah, thank you for that question, uh, Dr. Pinkisha. I, I think all these words are used, right? I mean, you use the word connection, you use the word, uh, what are the other words you suggested? Love, um, attachment. Uh, I mean, they have psychological resonance, I mean, psychological resonances, different resonances in psychology. Um, because attachment, as you know, is a, is a rather technical term. But all these are usually involved, you know, attachments, connections, or, or a sense of connectedness with the person. You know, all this is love. I think uh, all that is at one point or other, you feel that sense, you know, that the, the feeling that, you know, something that separates the one from the other dissolves, you know, and this dissolving element is love. The, 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 that is why I think Barrio says that one, uh, two fractures the one, right? So this connectedness is actually on the one hand an eruption and on the other hand a rupture, you know, there is, there is a fracture, but the, we, we love that fracture. And I think in this experience, we feel this connectedness. Or connection. I think all these terms, there are several other terms, right, that we use, right? We talk about sublimity, for instance, and love. Um, uh, there are so many other terms that are used in romantic uh, uh, literature for love. But connections, of course, uh, and connectedness are expressions, I mean, terms that are expressive of love, I think. Is there any questions on the way? Not any more questions, sir. Not in the QA and uh, not in the chat. There are 69 people probably. Uh... Give them a little more time, um, Rina, and then. Yes, sir. There's, there's one question, I think. Yes, one question is there from Pratima yeah. Agnihotri. Would the analysis extend to other aspects or types of love, such as love for parents, Filial, siblings, pet, concept, idea, or nation? I think that's a very valid question. It's a very interesting question, too, because we, it's an area that we haven't touched upon, right? I think um, the reason why, when we talk about the philosophy of love, for instance, we've been talking, actually, this is a philosophy of tau, tau, I mean, love that we've been talking about. Um, the notion that you know, um, actually, since we didn't have the time, I, I left out Luke Ferry. Luke Ferry has this beautiful notion about love, according to which he says that love is that which is sacred. I mean, how do you know that you have love for someone? If you love someone, that someone is sacred for you. 
Sacred in its etymological sense, as you know, means that for which you're willing to sacrifice your life. Uh, life. That's sacred. So the question that you need to ask now, today, yourself. What are those things or who are those people you're willing to sacrifice your life for? You will set aside your life for. Will you do that for your parents? Will you do that for your spouse? Will you do that for your nation? Or any other idea? Luke Ferry argues almost emphatically that we do not anymore, at least people, you know, generally in most parts of the world, we do not, we are not willing to die for the nation, not even for religion. Because we don't find them sacred. Of course, there is a discourse, an ideology of sacred nationalism or, you know, India is a very good example where somehow nationalism has become nationalism has become the sacred cow. You can't talk about it. You know, it is there. But the question here is a simple. If you're not willing to sacrifice your life, love for your parents, you don't have love for your parents. That's not true love. Whoever you are willing to do that for, when your adolescent son or daughter comes to you saying that I'm in love with someone, ask them this question, probably they'll help. You're saying that you're willing to sacrifice your life for, life, life for this person? They'll definitely say yes. Take time and see if they still, still say it. I think filial love, parental love, and the other love, they're all They're all, they all involve a commitment to eternity in time. I hope that clarifies the question. I really found that question very, very related to the talk that we had. Uh, that is Pratima. Uh, Pratima, you... Uh, yeah, I think... I think uh, yeah. Ma'am, Ashwati, ma'am, can you take up that question? There is... There's one uh, more question. Yeah, there is one more question. Uh, like, uh, sir, I was reminded of Azan Sita saying, Pranayam uru anali pambu kanakke nidrayai. Does love has such a serpentine quality to it that coils up at times? See, uh, love has, I said, love is as painful, as uh, dangerous as a revolution. That is the political aspect of it. There's no doubt about it. Love has prompted and will prompt murder, death, and suicide. There's no doubt about it. Depends on how you, when you, when you, when you say serpentine, you're at, what you have in mind is actually the, the deviousness, you know, of love. I mean, I wouldn't really go with that deviousness uh, argument, but uh, the danger side of it, you know, whenever you think of a snake, especially a serpent, two, two thoughts come to your mind. One is how elegant it is to how dangerous it is, right? The closer you are with the serpent, it is, you know, possible, more possible that you might die. You might get bitten, right? Yeah, I mean, the death of love is a very, very, uh, you know, uh, traumatic event. Falling out of love is a traumatic event. So if you, if you compare Lao to a serpent, you're living close to the serpent. You enjoy the beauty of the serpent, its elegance. And it's quite possible that the serpent can remain, can keep you safe. But I wouldn't buy, I wouldn't buy into, the, into this sexual, sexualization of that image. Serpent could be both the man and the woman. So, it is quite possible that just as love can happen as an event, a ruptural event, falling out of love can also happen as a ruptural event. In which case, of course, it's there. Love is, that's why Jean-Luc Nancy would call love thinking. Thinking is such a 
complex, contradictory kind of process. There's always, you know, in true Lao, in true Lao, there are no contradictions. There are antagonisms. Contradictions, and the, the, the difference between the two is that in contradictions, you, you accept a person's contradiction. And you become, become, I mean, for instance, suppose you're a, suppose you're a non-smoker and your partner is a smoker, right? It's a contradiction. But then you learn to live with it, it's a contradiction. But suppose you can't live with it, then it's an antagonism because antagonism is what prevents you from being who you are completely. Antagonism is what stops you from being who you are completely. Antagonism is the presence of the other that destroys your full expression. So there are a lot of antagonistic elements in love that will, you know, endanger the relationship. There's no doubt about it. But in marriage, what happens is the family, the state of the family, you know, over a period of time, these antagonisms solidify and freeze themselves into contradictions. You know, you stop fighting because you realize that his smoking is not none of my business. Her, her, you know, reading too much or not sleeping at the right time is none of my problems. You know, you, you have different timings. One is a, an all-nighter, works till two o'clock in the night. The other wants to hit the bed early and wake up early and so on. So that once you accept them, they're just contradictions. As, though, as long as they're con So I would even say that in, in the matter of long-term love, especially marital fidelity and so on, this is what happens. Antagonisms, one after the other, under the power of love, you know, collapse into contradictions. And these contradictions, you know, cease to cause problems. But at the same time, antagonisms cause problems. And remember, antagonisms are, they, they produce quarrels. And these quarrels must be seen not as, uh, not as something negative. When do you quarrel with your spouse or with your lover? When you, can you, when you can't take it anymore, right? In other words, quarrel is the only moment when you become authentic, become an authentic subject. That's the moment when you try to produce the truth of your own. So keep producing it. There's nothing wrong with that. You know, love is not easy, has never been easy. It is serpentine. Sir, would you mind taking one more question? There's one more question here in the chat box. Okay. Uh, which one is this? Is it Priyanka? Uh, it is from um, P.S. Rao. Okay, what is it? Promiscuity, promiscuousness in the unethical political alliance. Yes. Is the order of the day in the current political scenario. How can this be envisaged? Promiscuity in unethical political alliance is the order of the day in the current political scenario. I think it's Basically, talking about, uh, yeah. How can this be envisaged? Uh, Mr. Rao, can you can you clarify? I mean, I'm not sure I understand the question. You know, I understand in modern politics um, there is a lot of promiscuity. I mean, a lot of. Um, violation of ethical uh, standards or the very disappearance of it. I understand that, but uh, how can this be envisaged? That part is not clear. Sergeant, sir, are you speaking? Your mic is off. I, I think the, what the person who is asking whom, what the person um, means is that uh, promiscuity or even uh, sex scandals very often erupt uh, in the political circles. And issues of ethics, issues related to uh, f uh, fidelity, uh, integrity, all these do come up. 
so maybe the person the, the person yeah was... i think uh, no sajan i think uh, what he's talking about is um, uh, uh, these political alliances that are being created today are uh, totally unethical as you mentioned right um, is, it, is it simply that or because the, the, so many governments have been toppled down because of um, issues related to sexual sex scandal yeah, no, no. i think i think this is actually uh, um, based on a general understanding of the word politics uh, uh, mr rao i would say that politics is a I mean, the way we talked about it is much more a concept where you really um, you know um, you're not talking here you're talking here about the politics in the you know in the general populous sense of it right because the tendencies that we see in <clears throat> in parliamentary politics today the host trading and so on and so forth right um that is nothing to do with politics actually that state it's not politics state deals with see state is a very betrayal of political hall and this state what state engages in right now in india in this host trading this shameless home or, or you know buying purchasing of MLAs and so on. These are these are shameless acts, and these shameless acts are actually the very betrayal of political hall. They're not they're not something you can envisage. You know that must be. I, I can tell you. I can. I think my feeling is that a time will soon come when people really raise, you know, voice against this kind of thing, and this will be put. To, I mean, uh, th this particular promiscuity is. A kind of problem about which or against which an entire revolution can be start started, right? That is politics. What we see, these unethical political alliances that we are talking about, is nothing but the ways in which state attempts to, to, to strengthen its political base, its power. And political power is the state. It has nothing to do with politics in the sense we understand it. Politics in the sense we understand it is the putting an end, any act. I mean, it's a question, what can a collective do? This is not something that a collective does. This is, Mr. Rao, something that people elected by the collective, you know, some people who are elected by the collective do, over which collective has no power. Politics is a question to the collective, to the people in general. What can it do? I think this collective will one day take upon itself the task of toppling these kind of governments and putting them in right. Uh, I mean, in, in their places. I mean, that's all I can say. It is unfortunately the order of the day, as you said, but the order of the day never remains the order of the day. That's why we have politics. That's why we should have politics. We have one more question, Reena. Sir, I was reminded of Ashan Sida saying, Pranayam Uru Anali Pambukana case. Uh, I mean, this was the earlier question that you. Yes, sir. Uh, yeah. you, you took that question. Yeah, I did. Yeah. This speech. Uh, there's another comment. Or would the speech yeah, yeah, be published yeah. as an article? Yeah, no, yeah, this will be actually, I'm. I'm going to work on this uh, uh, with, um, you know, uh, a close friend of mine. We are going to publish it, but it will be both about uh, Luke Ferry and William Badu. It will be published as an article. Yeah. Dr. Rina, if there are no more questions, I think oh, yes, uh, we can think of winding up the session. Yes, sir. Uh, there's no, no more questions here. Uh, thank you very much. All the participants, especially uh, the participants who raised questions and, then, and made the session uh, more lively and meaningful and uh, special Thanks on behalf of all the listeners online to Dr. Kunyamadin, despite his uh, uh, throat problem, his physical uh, problem.
problem his fever and i because i've been seeing him for the last two days he has been a, a bit uh, wary of this uh, situation because whether he would be able to make this presentation because things were a little bit uncertain until the last moment but still it is wonderful that you made it happen because uh, we have all been looking forward to your presentation thank you very very much on behalf of all the uh, listeners participants and organizers of st teresa's and uh, al shifa's college manji um penindal uh, mana and uh, thank you uh, the faculty members who have been at the hem of affairs controlling um, the whole event thank you miss julia i think there was one miss julia who was asking me to give her give me her bio data and other things i haven't seen her uh, on the monitor doesn't matter thank you everyone over to you miss uh, dr reena uh, for the concluding remarks and if there is vote of thanks we will have the vote of thanks also i'll take take leave of you with your kind permission once again thank you everyone thank you uh, st teresa's college thank you al shifa's college thank you dr babu for uh, inviting me to chair this session uh, warm hi, wonderful happy new year to all of you and this is the first uh, uh, session that i am attending in 2022 let me see if th this would augur well for me and the, the people who are with me thank you very much bye bye sir as we have come to the end of this session i take this opportunity to thank everyone present here to make this session a grand success on that note i would like to extend my sincere gratitude towards the kerala state board for higher education teresa international and the department of sociology and center for research st teresa's college for arranging this seminar i express my sincere gratitude towards our honorable guest dr k k kunnahamad sir you have described in detail alan badius uh, philosophy which is poised between four conditions art love politics and science each of which is a complete truth procedure in itself you also quoted alan badius love does not compensate for anything love supplements i think this is very pertinent in this century because as you said now we see fall without love thank you so much sir for joining us and delivering this wonderful session i am grateful to dr n sarjan for the warm welcome for chairing this session and also for extending the views on love thank you so much sir finally i thank all the audience in attendance once again expressing love and gratitude to all you may kindly leave the meeting thank you thank you thank you babu thank you ashadi thank you vinitha reena thank and sajan thank you everyone thank you sir na kunyavasar lecture was a 